It was an interesting morning. We had some great presentations uh, covering a whole variety of use cases around telecom app development. The, we broke into uh, three sessions. I was really proud to see uh, on the TAD Summit site the three streams running in parallel and amazing content going across. I think our dangerous demo was, as I said, the most dangerous that uh, we've had uh, because we had several failures. It's always, I feel, a little bit of a cheat if we don't get some failures, and definitely we had a few failures there, so that was great. So, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce somebody that uh, I know many of us uh, know. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself. So I'll just hand over to uh, Vish, uh, who is, uh, after being in big corporate, is now joining the world of startups. So with that, over to you, Vish. Um, listen, I just uh, wanted to first just mention, um, uh, you know, how uh, grateful I am for uh, being able to, to present in front of the, the team today. Um, yeah, I've been um, uh, spending really the past six months or so uh, having some conversations with uh, a few folk um, who I respect within the telecom uh, industry, and uh, th those erupted into a, a series of um, you know, thoughts or observations about where we thought the industry was going. Um, and uh, I've since kind of um, put out some of those thoughts uh, in a series of uh, web blogs. And, um, and it was culminating, I, I guess, in this, uh, in this instance, um, to hopefully kind of string together a set of coherent observations that give us a, a bit of a, a mental model to understand where the telecom industry is going. Because I think that that tends to be um, you know, the, the question on everyone's lips, uh, certainly as you kind of take a look at some of the activity that's underway today, um, it seems hard to read the tea leaves. Uh, so I think without a doubt, there's a... Let me, uh, here. Without a doubt, it's, um, I think, uh, fairly evident to most folks that we're hitting a bit of a telecom tipping point. And, you know, when you Google telecom tipping point on Google Images, this is what you get. Um, you know, it doesn't seem that awe-inspiring, but I think, you know, really what I mean by this uh, is not so much that, you know, we've usurped the PC era um, or even that we've hit, you know, saturation of mobility. I'm really talking about um, a broader model of uh, really how the industry itself um, is moving through a life cycle from what Carlota Perez calls uh, an installation to a deployment phase. Um, and this is a, a very, um, you know, kind of slippery tip uh, because the industry can start to uh, fall into any number um, of different tracks. And uh, I think it's exciting uh, to be at the precipice of that. Um, but it also creates a lot of confusion and instability within the industry. Um, and so I wanted to explore a little bit what are the reasons behind that? Um, and how can we use um, some of that understanding of where the positions are today on the chessboard to understand what the next move should look like? And so I'm gonna talk about three, um, three basic uh, observations. One is uh, this notion of technology versus practice. Um, the second, I want to talk about um, this piece for wonder cycle that happens when something that was a product uh, transforms itself into utility and how the economics around that starts to reshape uh, the dynamics of the industry. Um, and then using that bit of situational awareness, I want to talk a little bit about um, how we could explore different business model strategies that help us to um, really reimagine how we can create uh, deliver and capture value with telecoms. So I think, you know, without a doubt, there is, um, I think, great awareness amongst the teams that network architecture is changing. Um, you know, I've been in telecoms for uh, a number of years now, and I started off in the early days where we had specialized products. And in fact, we designed those specialized products ourselves. Um, and we would, um, you know, use a scale up types of architectures that were highly centralized um, because the mean time to repair for a lot of this technology was very, very high. 
um, we would have to use high availability techniques, so N plus one. And uh, because of, of the mission critical nature of what we were developing in these case, uh, voice services, we had to do a lot of disaster recovery testing for continuity. Um, and over time, what happened is uh, a new uh, computer architecture really took hold. Um, and that started to subscribe to the systems um, that were scale out and didn't have shared dependencies between them. Um, that you didn't really have to worry about you know, cluster high availability. In fact, you could design for failure. Um, and that you could have an instance take over the state from another um, when you develop your applications to be truly stateless. Uh, and in fact, there was a sufficient compartmentalization and scale within um, your network that you could actually run on a continuous basis, um, you know, events and um, software that could actually try to take down uh, your network uh, so that it was continually being tested. And this is this notion of chaos engines. Um, and the key observation here is that we're moving from a life cycle of product to good enough commodities. And this is a fairly unstable time within a lot of operations teams within telecoms and with any other type of network provider. Because while we recognize these technologies coming out and they manifest themselves as things like network function virtualization, uh, they manifest themselves as you know, being able to fortify networks to create better traffic engineering in my systems, um, they they don't necessarily um, have a, a sufficient set of operational best practices. And um, with the evolution of technology to technology management, We've, you know, I think started to hit a front where operators are starting to try to embrace these technologies, uh, but they don't actually know what it is that they need to do in order to truly exploit them. And in fact, um, you've heard a lot of these new types of processes, whether it's DevOps or Agile, um, the, um, the shell of many telcos. And um, you know, you're, you're seeing a very distorted view of them in many cases. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of CEOs who walk around saying, I want some of that agile software. I want us to API everything. Or in fact, you know, what we should really do from an IT perspective is put up a bimodal uh, two-speed IT system. And you know, the, the peril that comes with that kind of discussion is that um, it doesn't really uh, get to the root of why in fact you're trying to do these things. Um, you know, what's the value of, uh, you know, taking, you know, what is a whole set of new tools that are um, cropping up in the industry and exploiting them for agility and operational cost reduction within a telco. And there's this notion of, you know, the, these, these different types of, um, you know, uh, archetypes that operators could try to undertake. And, um, certainly, there is an, an, an understanding of agility, um, but there is a growing understanding that agility isn't enough. It's not about from moving one point to the next. It's about more of a continual process. And we're just starting to hit what those best practices for something like an anti-fragile organization would look like. And so this notion has evolved more slowly than this technology has been what's holding back a lot of the industry. It's a, a massive embrace of technology, not a great understanding of what are the processes that need to be in place to actually uh, take these uh, technologies to advantage. Um, and, you know, I think what you'll find is that uh, a lot of telcos, a lot of network operators uh, will start talking about large transformation projects. Um, you know, if you're in the consulting biz, you love transformation projects. It means a lot of money is going to be spent. Uh, but there is, you know, an error in the assumption behind transformation projects. That error is that I'm going to move from this one state to this next state. And when that next state comes, boy, it's going to be really, really great. As opposed to that this is actually a process where I'm continually trying to adapt because change is coming so quickly that the actual um, capability that I'm trying to build is an ability to reduce the cost of change. 
Um, and that's, that's a very different principle um, that hasn't necessarily been recognized within many of the telecom companies that, that I've had the pleasure of knowing. Um, and this notion of how do you navigate that um, is also being interpreted as a one-size-fits-all type of um, type of uh, mental model. So, so you'll hear a lot of different IT and even network organizations talk about we need to be agile um, and you know let let's set up scrums and uh, let's put up you know uh, notification cards and um, have Kanban systems. All of these things are uh, you know I think uh, very pursued. Uh, topics of capability that you'll find as a discussion point in almost any uh, telco today. I think the issue here is that, you know, it has its place, but it's not a one size fits all type of capability. Um, you don't want to apply agile techniques to, for instance, something that you really just want to reduce the cost of deviation for. Um, and that might be your batteries, or it might be your server equipment, maybe. Um, any type of capability um, that has accrued a, a tremendous amount of functionality that's dependent on it working. I um, mean, that's where you still need to have Six Sigma type uh, processes to understand what deviations. And then you have in the middle a whole series of products that have to be managed very differently than you do with something. Um, and that's, you know, applying a lean methodology so that you can reduce waste. And this life cycle of capabilities of component piece parts across um, any different uh, organizations, um, IT and network infrastructure, needs to be managed as a kind of a horses for courses kind of system. And this is uh, something that you know, Simon Wardley speaks about um, in quite um, you know, vocally uh, and encourage you to read some of his thoughts and uh, blogs on this topic. But uh, having said that, this is also where you see a breakdown in things like uh, two-speed ID, where they polarize things between Agile and Six Sigma and forget the middle part, uh, because you can't have a, a steady stream of things moving from you know, an Agile uh, environment directly into a Six Sigma environment. It needs to pass through a product phase uh, where the system can learn to scale, uh, become robust enough that it can take on sufficient mass of mission critical capability. And so this system is not two speed. It's a system um, that has, in fact, you know, three um, you know, very definitive cogs in order to make the machine run. Um, and when you look at all that, and you take a look at what's out in the industry, there's these massive questions that telecos have um, that they're all struggling with. And it's this notion of, well, do I go to my vendors and buy highly specialized capability for big price tags? in order to get into this model of having sufficient agility and being able to run that continuum all the way to uh, you know, my full operational process being hardened around uh, these technologies? Um, or do I actually invest in engineers myself and avail um, you know, the, the, the organization of the very excellent open source capabilities that are out there? Um, and what you actually see is within most of the industry is that there's a U-shaped adoption curve uh, where you'll see that, you know, kind of very small or agile, like wireless ISPs, those types uh, are actually um, taking the do-it-yourself approach uh, just simply because of the cost of the equipment, whether it's, you know, buying um, a large automation or too expensive. So they're going to do it on their own. Uh, and then you'll find very, very large organizations who basically have to pay license fees um, that are just extravagant um, will also take it on. So this would be, you know, the large tier one telecos, or even if you take a look at, you know, some of the larger digital uh, players in the field like Amazon or um, Facebook, they tend to take this approach. So it's interesting that Gartner of all places would have to uh, you know, evangelize this notion that, you know, we need to start to take a, a very definitive move uh, between investing in specialized network components to investing in specialized network skills. Uh, and so this is a very much a case of building the organization, the people required to actually create that agility within 
uh, your organization so that you can continually adapt. <laughs> So why is all that happening? Why do we need to change out the skill sets in telecom? And the uh, the answer is, you know, kind of been a kind of answered in a, in a number of different ways, depending on who you talk to. My uh, perspective is that what's happening is that we're moving away from a product to a utility in terms of what we're managing. And this is very similar to what has happened with compute where a compute was a server that you bought from a company like HP or Dell. And then um, it started to commoditize as virtualization came in and capital efficiencies and multi-tenancy could uh, be extracted uh, it, when it became um, a cloud capability. Uh, something very similar is happening to network. And you know, if I take a look at the journey uh, to cloud computing, um, and you could kind of uh, pace it, this is a, a a uh, illustration that VMware put uh, together to kind of describe their contribution to the field. And what I've kind of added in is a set of um, descriptions around what the innovation and the benefits were. So as we you know, had discrete servers, uh, you had different applications that were deployed on those servers and that's the way you segregated and managed. Um, as you brought in virtualization, you were able to consolidate you gained a tremendous capital efficiency and you're able to defer expenses. This is a great thing for enterprises. Um, you're able to get to, to multi-tenancy because you notice that you could do arbitrage and this whole notion of capacity on demand uh, within your compute facility suddenly became a reality. Um, automation orchestration was large cloud management services starting to come in. Um, and that really started to lead the way into the IS business model and the notion of cloud computing. Um, I think a similar journey is now happening at the very root of telecom. I think this journey is happening from a network capacity perspective, and it's been forced because of the changes that we've seen in computer architectures. Um, but there's some problems in trying to get there. The big problems in moving to what I'll call kind of a cloud network has been that as we've moved from the switch router box era into network function virtualization, there's been some resource starvation in terms of, is there sufficient bandwidth liquidity out there to get the type of multi-tenancy that we'd like? Sure, we can use the VLANs, but we don't have the abundance of bandwidth that we would like to be able to create an arbitrage system of capacity on demand. And in fact, the only way we can do that is in very discrete instances, like on a, you know, uh, an optical DWDM ring where I've you know, deployed the capacity and now it's depreciated. Um, but because we haven't bandwidth, this notion of liquidity and capacity is mean, actually very difficult to, um, to, to actually exploit within the networking world. And I think uh, you know, really trying to make models to uh, liberate the business so you can actually have uh, a way to do arbitrage on capacity. Um, the mobile cord initiative uh, that at and started um, as well as notions at a piece part like cloud radio access networks are so we're close, but we're kind of not there yet. And the question is, you know, uh, you know, what's it going to take for us to get there? Um, now, you know, as as I've had this conversation, I've had a number of you know different um, I guess challenges to the notion that you know, this, this liquidity event in terms of bandwidth being massively and easily available such that it can reduce the cost and, and risk of experimentation um, is, you know, is already there. And you can kind of see this in two instances. When I look at a company like Akamai or a content delivery network, um, its whole existence is based on the fact that if you look at the middle in the global model of the internet, uh, capacity is there in abundance and it's super cheap. And so a company like Akamai can build an overlay network to deliver content across that available capacity. Uh, and that capacity is you know, largely the inner data center links, the private pairing links, the transit networks uh, that are the core of the internet. And that core has kind of evolved to a massively dense paired infrastructure. Uh, and that's because the cost of capacity has come down so precipitously. So companies like Akamai Content Delivery Networks 
now can carry the substantial amount of the internet core traffic. Uh, you know, they, they carry well over 50% of internet traffic today. Um, and that's largely because bandwidth has become utility in the global and the middle mile. The place where it's been struggling has been in the first mile. And we're starting to see the weak signals of first mile bandwidth arbitrage. Um, and you're seeing this come on the back of technologies like network function virtualization and software-defined networks. You're seeing an outcropping of something called software-defined wide area networking. And companies like Ariaka, like Velo Cloud and others are starting to dominate this space where they're providing overlay tunnels on top of you know, very low cost local loop technology. And they're competing now with MPLS port technology because it can be offered so cheaply and uh, with you know, sufficient security and quality that an enterprise is willing to run um, the cloud traffic across it. So we're seeing the first signs of it, but it, it, it's starting, uh, or rather it hasn't really gotten that terminal velocity it needs to truly become a commodity. <laughs> And so I want to talk a little bit about that notion of how do things become commodity. And a lot of the problem within First Mile is around the fixed costs. And a lot of people, you know, tend to confuse, you know, the, the notion of, uh, you know, how much does it cost for a, you know, a, a mobile connection? And you know, AT and T or, or Verizon is making a ton of cash off my back. Um, and you know, the marginal cost of carrying my bits are very, very low. That, that's true, but not true. Um, the way telcos work is they have to spend a lot of money to deploy all this stuff. Um, and that, that, that money is in the form of, of a ton of fixed costs. They need to basically set up a cell site for you know, a minimum of 1,000 people coverage, and it might cost them you know, upwards of somewhere around um, you know, uh, you know, 20,000 to 30,000 a year to maintain that. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a high fixed cost for 1,000 people. That's assuming those 1,000 people are actually subscribers. So the way you actually break even is that you have to have adoption rate, and that's why telcos are obviously you know, critically aware of what their subscriber rate is. It's almost a winner's take all market, because as you build out all that capacity, you gain the subscribers, the marginal cost or the operating income starts to go up. So this is a, this is a pretty a critical uh, understanding that you need to have um, of mobile networks and of um, any type of uh, wireline network is that they operate on something called operational leverage. Um, now, what's happening is that those fixed costs are starting to drop. Um, and they're dropping for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, the equipment costs are coming down, you know, raw, raw Moore's law. Um, we're finding that you know, there's different spectrum regimes. In fact, the unlicensed spectrum regime is starting to uh, gain traction here in the US um, with companies like Comcast and the cable consortium coming in. Um, but there are some dominant poles that are restricting uh, the ability of um, first mile networks to be reduced in cost. And that's cell site leases in its labor costs. Uh, backhaul as a recurring cost is also a significant uh, pull in the economic equations. Now, there's certain things that are happening that are actually uh, conspiring to make this a lot better. Um, you know, the advent of small cells has precipitated a, a, a much more turnkey operation in terms of being able to deploy in the construction of civils cross zoning and permitting costs for small cell deployment. Um, and the same thing is from leases. But we're also seeing this whole ships. Uh, whether it's the uh, Google Project Loon or the Quilla Project, um, that are starting to make significant inroads in um, that cost equation as well, simply because labor costs to roll out um, when you put something at stratospheric heights is significantly cheaper. Um, and so those things are starting to create, uh, you know, really a, a lowering of the ceiling on what the fixed costs look like for rolling out a network. This is important because it's giving us that ability to create the liquidity in the market. We're also seeing some new types of technologies start to come to the fore. Uh, you're seeing companies like Starry who are using YGIG, uh, who are using very, very low cost equipment, um, you know, from tower top, or rather rooftop type towers um, that have unlicensed links 
uh, to a windowsill um, where you have an antenna mounted and that's plugged into some Wi-Fi distribution in home. Um, and they're able to you know, take that from um, you know, what it would cost today uh, to uh, build out a residence for fixed broadband. Let's say that costs about $600 to $800. Starry can do that for about $25. Um, and these cost advantages are starting to reduce um, that cost ceiling that we've had in terms of building out lower cost capacity. Um, you know, you've got things like UAVs, you've got free space optics that are starting to become very real. And then you've also got 5G um, that's increasing spectral efficiency using larger multiplexing bandwidths. And the net effect of all that is a massive reduction in what the cost for bandwidths is going to look like over the course of the next 10 years. So understanding that we've now got practices to create agility, we've also got um, a future in which we know that capacity is going to become um, a commodity, a utility, that there's going to be a cycle from uh, capacity being a product um, that sits in network boxes that is going to move to a commodity and that, that same thing happened to compute and there was a massive reordering um, in the order of the ecosystem. Uh, how is that going to play out within uh, telecoms? How is that going to play networking become? You know, it's something that, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up my last slide here. Um, so prediction is very difficult. So what we want to do is try to understand how is value changing when the network becomes a utility. And you know, when we take a look at contemporary history of mobile telephony and mobile compute, you know, clearly, you know, the, the, the operator moved from an area where they created value by connecting people. They uh, were able to deliver that value using their network uh, and mobile phones, and they were able to capture value using uh, a combination of subscriptions um, or uh, free-for-all. Uh, as we went to mobile compute, what happened is uh, applications and open developer ecosystems took place, and that created the new value uh, within um, the mobile world. And you know, value was delivered through those app stores, and operators didn't necessarily control those gateway points. They still captured value using uh, you know, data subscriptions. What they want to do as they move forward to a commodity world is to try to get out of uh, selling capacity moving towards let's get into content um, and or let's try to take the piece dividend from mobile compute and these smartphones and exploit all these sensor capabilities that are low cost and enter into the IoT world um, and start to vertically integrate in underserved markets an opportunity to capture uh, an application layer of capability and value uh, to increase revenues. Um, so those are happening now. The consolidating play, which you're seeing with you know, CenturyLink, you know, buying up companies like Level 3, um, you're seeing companies trying to increase their leverage, uh, but you know, that's really just a, um, you know, kind of a, an intermediate play. Uh, what they really need to do is change their business model. Um, what I think is going to happen is that as those markets become overserved, we're going to need to see some platform capabilities start to take place. And I think this is where the new value creation is going to happen. I think we're, we're starting to see an ability to do rapid config of networks uh, combined with the uh, agile teams, uh, combined with the monitoring capability to create a new platform layer for network apps. And I know this has been a very positive discussion that's happened over the course of Tag Summit. Um, I think that capability is going to give operators a position where they're going to be able to exploit the innovations, the higher order innovations that are built across their networks in order to start to commoditize those innovations and create a greater mode of competitiveness for themselves. I think fundamentally that's going to key on what the new value is. And that new value is being able to connect data to applications. Um, and you know, this is a topic of a new set of uh, blog posts that I'm going to be making on creating an ultimate future of data fabrics within telco. Um, that's kind of the very quick overview of kind of how I see the industry moving. I know I'm kind of right into the red on time, so I'm gonna stop there, Alan, and open it up for some questions.
That is excellent. Thank you so much, Fish. So a round of applause for what uh, Vish shared with us there. I think that is very aligned to some of the demos we saw in the Dangerous demo. I think it's aligned to the presentation we heard from uh, John Zanus from uh, Canonical. So I think uh, you're preaching to the converted there. So uh, well done, Vish. It's always uh, good to get that enforcement. Because of time, uh, because we've got another remote presentation uh, with uh, Alan Masarek, the CEO of Vonage, I have to sort of, uh, you know, we've done our time here. So what I'd suggest is uh, if you do have any questions for Vish, we can take them offline, and I'm sure Vish will be happy to uh, go through that. So again, Vish, thanks so much Great. for your time, and uh, I'll speak to you soon, okay? Great. Thanks, Alan. You're Cheers. welcome. Bye-bye.